Welcome to The Backstory with Dr. Ricky Singh. This podcast is focused on bringing you the latest research-based information about dramatically improving health, well-being, and quality of life. And here's your host, Dr. Ricky Singh. You know, there's so much information and misinformation out there on testosterone and a lot of it's speculation, uh, which is why I'm look, looking forward to having this discussion today. Uh, but men put all kinds of psychological weight on their testosterone number. You know, a low one kind of makes you think you're uh, less manly and a high one kind of confers you're basically LeBron James. Uh, but I think that's where we get a lot of it wrong. So we want to learn the truth. So my guest today is the director of male sexual health. Also assistant professor of urology and reproductive medicine here at Wall Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian Hospital. He's a member of the American Urological Association as well as the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. His clinical and research interests focus on erectile dysfunction, penile prosthetic surgery, and male infertility. So I'm really excited. You know, many of my patients ask me questions related to testosterone. Uh, so I'm very excited to please welcome Dr. James Kashanian to the backstory. Dr. Kashanian, welcome. Dr. Singh, thank you so much for having me here today. So I wanted to touch on a few topics, you know, first having to do with hormonal changes. You know, I recorded a podcast earlier this week uh, that's already been released to the listeners on women and menopause and the midlife program that we have here at Wall Cornell. And some discuss as males, as men go through this experience in their life, it's uh, sometimes called andropause. So tell us what is happening in the body with lowering testosterone and declining levels of testosterone in men. Sure. So Dr. Singh, I think when you, you say andropause, I think what you're alluding to is late onset hypogonadism or what we call age-related low testosterone. And as we age, all of us age, once we hit about 40 years old, uh, every year there's about a 1% drop in, in total testosterone levels or numbers every year. And as life goes on, our testosterone declines. But that doesn't mean that just because we have lower testosterone levels than we did when we were 20 or 25 years old, that doesn't mean that one, we're less manly, or two, that we have symptoms that are associated with low testosterone. I think the most important thing um, is that not all size, you know, not all testosterone levels fit, fit every man. So, you know, a young man with a testosterone level uh, of five or 600 may experience some symptoms actually of low testosterone. And, and a man who has a, maybe a 60 or 70 year old man who has a testosterone level of, let's say, 350, um, they might feel just as great as they did when they were 30 or 40 years old. So what are some of those symptoms? When you say either hypogonadism or low normal testosterone, what are some of the symptoms that you know, patients typically present? Yeah. With? So if you look at the urology guidelines, the endocrine society guidelines, you know, the cutoff for low testosterone is, is about 300. And again, that's not a, a line in the sand. Someone with a testosterone that's uh, higher than that, 300, 400, that's experiencing symptoms of low testosterone could may potentially really benefit from treatment. And someone, let's say a man who has a testosterone 250, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's suffering from uh, hypogonadism or symptoms of. But classical symptoms of low testosterone are going to be things like low energy, low sex drive, erectile dysfunction. They can even have you know, poor sleep, poor mood, depressed mood, uh, some anxiety. Um, some other uh, signs of low testosterone can be breast tenderness or enlargement, um, central obesity, and even uh, low bone mineral density, to name a few. You know, some of those things are probably tough for the listeners to appreciate that they have, such so as there's low bone mineral density. But like, take me, for example. I'm 40s, early 40s. I don't have the energy that I used to have in my 20s and 30s. Maybe the libido is a little bit less than when we were in college and things like that. I don't know if I have low testosterone. I mean, and probably the listeners out there, the majority of us might be like me. You know, I had a little bit of a dad bod when uh, I had my second child. It's a little central obesity. Does that mean I should come in and get my testosterone checked? So again, I think it's really specific for every patient. I, th I think they need to look at at themselves, and they also have to have a conversation with their primary care doctor. I think if they have two or three classical symptoms of low testosterone, then it makes sense to get an early morning testosterone level drawn, because that's when testosterone tends to peak in, in young, healthy males, and see what the level shows. If the level is well within the normal range, then I think you need to look elsewhere for, the, for those symptoms. And the biggest problem with symptoms of low testosterone is they're not specific. So erectile dysfunction, for example, can manifest as a result of low testosterone, or it can manifest as a result of underlying diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, or it could also be related to performance anxiety. So one symptom alone isn't going to make the diagnosis of hypogonadism and low testosterone. It's usually a constellation of symptoms along with a low testosterone level. 
so you know that it's challenging right just like you said if i feel a certain way less energy you know less uh recovery than i used to i check my testosterone in the morning and let's say it's in the normal range how do we know that that's not actually low for me and that's just low c- according to the normal data well that, that's a that's a, a common difficulty that i think us as physicians have when we practice and i think when i started i said not every testosterone fits every male so it, it, it's very it, somewhat nuanced. It's not all cut and dry. Some patients are very cut and dry. Some patients come in with testosterone levels in the 100s with, with very classic symptoms. Uh, but then in other patients who, who come in with, with maybe testosterone levels in, in the low normal range and have some specific and some nonspecific symptoms. So the first thing you really want to do is you want to rule out certain risk factors and see if they can naturally increase their testosterone level, naturally resolve some of the stresses in life. Maybe talk to them about uh, lifestyle modifications, not only diet and exercise, but also alcohol use, illicit drug use, smoking, which also can affect the same things that may have, that may be related to low testosterone. So let's talk about some of those. What are some of the non-pharmacologic treatments for someone with either normal, low, or, or low testosterone? So, so usually the, the conversation I have with patients is uh, I usually tell them the same thing that's good for their overall health is going to be good for their sexual health, is going to be good for their erectile health, and is going to be good for their hormonal health as well. So something as simple of you know three to five days of regular cardiac exercise, 30 to 45 minutes a day, that's on the cardiac websites, that's on the diabetic websites, and that, that's on our website as well. So anything that's good for your heart and your overall health, everything that's good for your, heart, your blood pressure and your cholesterol is going to be good for your sexual health as well. So that's where I start. And then we get into it a bit more about what their general lifestyle is. Are they drinking a half a bottle of wine every night, which can also cause some medical conditions, but also re- cause some sexual dysfunction? Uh, are they are they avid smokers? Um, are they using you know certain illicit drugs like uh, excess marijuana use can also affect you know hormone levels and testosterone levels? So it's a, it's a full discussion. It's going through the entire medical history, social history, going through medications, and even in surgical history also that can have implications on on their health. You know, I can imagine a lot of people listening out there thinking about. You know, I don't exercise enough. Maybe I drink too much. Maybe someone smokes and I, therefore I have low energy. They probably don't connect the dots saying, you know what, maybe this is a hormonal issue. So what do you, what do you tell those patients? You know, how do you know when it's just optimizing these um, non-pharmacological treatments or is it I need to come in and get my levels checked? I think everyone, no matter who you are, should be following regularly with a primary care doctor. And if there's any concerns, those are the concerns that should be brought up at the time of your primary care visit. And if you you saw your primary care doctor within the year, but you have new concerns that have come up or something that you maybe slipped your mind and you didn't have time to discuss, I think it, it makes sense to reach out to, to that physician, whether it's a primary care doctor, whether it's a urologist, or, or even if it's your, your spine specialist. You know, it's a conversation that should be started and then see where that discussion leads you. It's the same thing with men that I see with erectile dysfunction. I mean, these guys, they suffer at home two, three, five, ten years before they even have a conversation with their partner, let alone their doctor. And unless they're starting the conversation or their physician's bringing it up, then they're going to suffer in, in silence for years until, until it gets too late or too severe. You know, I had this discussion with uh, one of our OBs here about starting the conversation. You know, men, it's a little bit easier, right? We see commercials about ED all the time. We're like, you know what? Maybe I want to try this pill. Let me talk to my primary care or my urologist. Whereas women talking about libido changes is not as regularly discussed. So I think what you shared is is compelling. We need to be open to talking about it amongst men, among, amongst their, your doctors to optimize your sexual health. So let's say the patient has optimized these behavioral changes. They're cutting their alcohol. They're cutting their illicit substances, hopefully to zero. They're exercising more. And still, they're not feeling the way they want to. What if they just say, you know what? I want to feel younger again. I want that energy. I want to get rid of this midsection. I want my six-pack back. Are these indications for, for seeking treatment? I think muscle growth and increased stamina, I think that there's, there's a fine line for where you're talking about starting medication for kind of anabolic use rather than starting for a, a combination of reasons. And realistically, if you're going to be feeling you know, less energy at the gym, less strength, central obesity, you're probably going to be having some other symptoms of, of hypogonadism and low testosterone. And the constellation of those things are, are indication enough to start a, a medical treatment. 
So let's talk about those treatments. What are the currently available options? What are things that you tend to lean towards first and then subsequently? Yeah, so there's a whole host of testosterone treatments out there now. There's, you know, the, the, the typical testosterone replacement is giving exogenous testosterone to a patient, meaning giving the actual testosterone medication to a patient. Those come in the forms of patches, gels, nasal sprays, pills, injections, and then, you know, pellets that can be inserted. Uh, the difference between all of them is a lot of times cost, to be honest with you, and, and insurance coverage, but also is, uh, is mode of application. So things like gels, which we often start with, are easy on, easy off. You apply them every day. Um, you get sustained levels four to six hours, and then levels taper off later on in the day. Whereas injections or pellets, you get more sustained levels for a longer period of time, either weeks to months. And those are usually good for, for longer term treatment. Once you've realized that patients really will benefit from testosterone replacement and they might not be getting the results that they'd like to get from, from either gels or patches or, or sprays. And is the goal of these treatments to just temporarily increase the test levels or to do that so the patient feels better? but still optimizing their natural test production along the way. So one important thing that's sometimes a misconception is that we start patients on testosterone replacement, and then you see a patient back you know, six weeks later, and they say, Doc, I took it for four weeks. I feel great, but the last couple of weeks, you know, it's just not working anymore, meaning that they only took it for four weeks, and they didn't realize it's going to be a more long-term treatment. Testosterone replacement has got to be looked at as a long-term, if not lifelong treatment. So it's something that patients are either going to be taking every day, once a week, or coming in maybe for a procedure every, you know, three to six months or so. The symptoms that will uh, improve on testosterone replacement will be gradual. Initially, uh, you know, men may feel an improvement in, in their energy, in their mood, their concentration over the first, you know, month or two. And then their sexual function might take a little bit longer to really see significant improvements. It could take three to even up to six months of true testosterone replacement to really see a, a meaningful benefit. So it sounds like that decision to really start someone on exogenous testosterone has to be taken seriously because if this is a lifelong therapy and the goal isn't to really increase natural test production and correct me if I'm wrong, but more so to just manage the symptoms, then you really want to optimize the non-pharmacological treatments first. Absolutely. What is the downside? What are the risks? You know, patients come in and say what I've said, energy, obesity, mood, et cetera, libido. I want test therapy. What are some of the contraindications that you discuss with them? So I think before we get into the contraindications or, or, or complications of testosterone replacement, it's important to also understand the complications of having low testosterone. So it's not only the low energy, low sex drive, erectile dysfunction, but there have been hundreds of studies that look at you know increased metabolic syndrome, increased vas cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke in men who actually have chronically low testosterone levels. And I think there's been a lot of discussion around the side effects of testosterone replacement, those potentially being vascular disease, heart disease, heart attack, stroke, which should be taken seriously, but at the same time, it should be understood that men who suffer from low testosterone are at that risk at baseline. Other side effects of low testosterone, and this is usually the longest conversation I have with patients, is not about the benefits to it. It's usually about the side effects. And they range from everything from things like uh, swelling in the hands and feet, breast tenderness or enlargement, you know, you can get increased acne, you can get increased body hair. Uh, what men don't realize is you can get decreased head hair, so it can speed up your, your hair loss. You can get increased red blood cell count or hemoglobin, increased hemoglobin hematocrit, slightly increased blood pressure. And then there's the, the vas cardiovascular risk that the FDA put out a, a statement on a few years ago. Uh, and then also there's a black box warning on, on all testosterone replacement that it could put men at increased risk of DVTs or, or clots in the calves. You know, what you said interesting, what you said earlier is very interesting. You know, I, I grew up in the 80s. I was a child of WWF, now called WWE. And I remember watching wrestlers like Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, Chris Benoit, and all these people who obviously took exogenous steroids and subsequently may have died of some cardiovascular event. But earlier you said that having low T also puts you at risk for some cardiac event. So how do you kind of balance the two between low T and treating it and having that same risk? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's the, the, the discussion. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's balancing the risks of being hypogonadal to the potential risks of starting testosterone replacement. Although I think that the risk of 
living a life with hypogonadism is, is significantly higher than, than starting testosterone replacement, especially if you're doing it with someone that follows the, the patient closely with serial labs and just doesn't prescribe the medication let the patients you know, sail off into the sunset. So what does that look like? What does that kind of following the patient and management look like? How often are you adjusting your doses? How often are you checking lab work to make sure you're not under-treating or over-treating? So I'm pretty uh, OCD about it uh, with, with an initial patient. The, you know, the first year studying, studying a patient on testosterone replacement, I might see him three or four times in the first year. So I usually see him about four to six weeks after they initially start it, and then probably three months later, and then in six-month intervals. And then once they're on a stable dose, they're feeling well, and we have all their hormone levels checked. We have your complete blood count checked. We check a PSA. And those are all stable. Then, you know, we move on to Q6 month uh, follow up and visits and labs. And that's just how I personally do it. And, and I think a lot of us in, in the field do it. Going back to some of the treatment options, you mentioned the gels, uh, you mentioned some of the topical agents, injectable. What about oral? Can, is there oral tests that can be bioavailable to the patient? So there, there is a new uh, oral treatment that's recently FDA approved. I, I think there's there's some benefits to it. I think there's some nuances to taking it. You have to take it three times a day dosing with a you know heavier calorie meal. And I think just speaking to patients and men, it, it can be somewhat cumbersome. I think getting a man to put on a, a, a gel, let's say, or a patch even daily can sometimes be cumbersome. They often forget the dose. They'll travel. They'll leave the medication at home. So expecting them to take a pill three times a day, I think, is also a little bit more difficult. So one of the symptoms that seems more obvious to the listeners out there is sexual dysfunction. You know, energy and midsection obesity and stamina and strength may not be so obvious. You know, people go to the gym regularly. But where do you draw the line between erectile dysfunction and erectile not functioning the way it used to 20 years ago? And how do kind of patients recognize that to say, you know what, I think I should get this evaluated? You know, if you look at the classic definition of erectile dysfunction, it's basically an erection not sufficient for sexual activity. So that might mean something different to you versus to me versus, you know, someone that we have walk off the street. So, you know, erectile dysfunction as a, as a definition is just not functioning to your, to your benefit. I would say that almost all patients that I see in my office and, and I see, you know, I saw six new patients today with erectile dysfunction. I checked the testosterone level in all of them because it can be one of the presenting symptoms uh, of low testosterone. And whether it's a gradual decline or, or a sudden decline, I think it's a worthwhile test to get for, for a guy presenting an erectile, with, with erectile dysfunction. And for those patients, you don't have to violate HIPAA today, but for the, most of the patients that you see with ED, how much is it that the test is the cause of that versus some other psychological or underlying vascular disorder? I would say about 10 to 20% of the time we find an underlying low testosterone level um, that can often be addressed and treated and, and improve the erectile function. In addition to some of the pharmacological treatments and the behavioral modifications, what about supplements? You know, patients come and ask me about how can I increase my test naturally? I mean, supplements are a tough conversation anyway because they're not FDA regulated. But what are some of the things that you hear about in your clinic that you say, you know what, that's nonsense? And other things that you, you say, you know what, might as well give it a try. It's safe and it might be effective. You know, I think the problem with supplements, as you said, it's not regulated. So even what the package insert said is on the actual supplement it oftentimes isn't. And, and the classic example is these uh, vitality supplements, these uh, er even erectile function boosting supplements, where they say that they have all these uh, natural herbal remedies, when it, in fact, you know, they've been studied and they actually have trace amounts or, or more than trace amounts of what we call PD-5 inhibitors, things like Viagra, like Cialis, that are actually placed in these supplements to give the benefit that they're actually saying. That it's just not disclosed. Uh, I think with testosterone replacement, I think there are certain supplements, hormones that can manipulate the, the body's production of hormones, can it, it manipulate certain hormones in the body to make it look like, let's say, total testosterone levels are going up. But in fact, what's important, which is their free or bioavailable testosterone, really is staying virtually the same and not really uh, improving any symptoms they might have. And, and a classic example of that is something called ashwagandha, which can affect SHBG levels and then can affect total testosterone levels, increasing total testosterone levels. But realistically, at the end of the day, the bioavailable testosterone, which is really the important factor, stays exactly the same. Are there ways whether it's behavioral or even pharmacological, to increase our production of tests? You know, right now we've been talking about TRT replacement therapy, but can I take something to actually 
manipulate or hack the hypothalamic access to improve my test levels? Yeah, it's an excellent question. It's something that we use all the time in, male, in men who, who we see for infertility. And I think one side effect of testosterone that I failed to mention is actually infertility. So exogenous testosterone will actually cut down the uh, pituitary gonadal access and will decrease your endogenous or your body's production of testosterone. And it also will decrease the body's production of sperm. So the uh, WHO actually looked at testosterone replacement years ago as a potential for male contraception. So men that we see for low testosterone who are interested or who are actively trying to have children, there are some options for them that don't involve exogenous treatment with testosterone replacement. So there are other medications that can manipulate either the hypothalamic pituitary axis or can directly stimulate the testosterone to produce testosterone that will in turn preserve fertility that are beneficial to this male population. And those medications include what are called CIRMs, aromatase inhibitors, or uh, just HCG, which is given as an injection, which directly stimulates the testicles to produce testosterone. Do you think overall from the patients you see as a society in America, do we under treat low T or is it appropriate or people taking exogenous testosterone without physician guidance? Yeah, I think if you look 20 years ago, and I think the pendulum has swung a bit. I think if you look 20 years ago, there was a study that was done that really looked at over treatment of men with TRT and testosterone replacement and probably doing so not safely. And and that was really when the companies came out and were starting to advertise for testosterone replacement. And then there were some studies that came out with the potential cardiovascular effects of testosterone replacement in in the uh, early 2010 and the beginning of, uh, I guess, last decade now, 2010 to like 2015. And then I think a lot of physicians who are prescribing, primary care doctors, endocrinologists, urologists, I think they really became somewhat timid and scared about what the potential side effects could be. So they stopped prescribing. And I think now recently over the past maybe three to five years, we've seen an uptake in testosterone replacement, a lot more well-done studies done on testosterone replacement, understanding where it's beneficial, where it's not beneficial, where the side effects can manifest, and really how to safely prescribe the medication. So I think now we're in kind of an uptick, but in a safe uptick. You know, you also see, you know, with the use of technology and innovation, there's so many companies that come direct to consumer, like Roman and others, all these companies that say, you know, we'll send us your blood samples and we'll prescribe test. What are some of the pros and cons of what you see when you see these kind of TRT clinics? Yeah, I, I think that can end up being a, a slippery slope. I think more so than some of these other, you know, online telehealth companies where they're prescribing potentially, let's say, erectile dysfunction medications or sexually transmitted infection medications like for, for herpes or, or even like fertility testing. I think with testosterone replacement, you really have to have very close monitoring and follow up with your patients. And if you can do that virtually, then I think that can be safe and effective, but it's hard to, you know, examine a patient virtually. And, and my personal opinion is that any patient that started on testosterone replacement, they should at least be examined once a year. They should have a good general urinary exam and they should have a prostate exam. And if they can do that separately with a primary care doctor while they're being prescribed testosterone replacement with, with a telehealth company, then I think that's fine. I just think the care has to be coordinated. You know, you touched on another uh, topic of prostate health. So how does low T affect prostate and then giving it exogenously? Are there contraindications, someone with a history of prostate cancer or in their family? And what kind of questions do you ask and where do you draw the line? Another very excellent question, and I think a topic we could spend probably the whole day speaking about. In short, testosterone drives a prostate growth and prostate enlargement. Prostates enlarge as you get older. Prostates enlarge with testosterone replacement. But that's more so benign enlargement. If men have low to low normal testosterone levels, increasing their testosterone level from, let's say, you know, 250 to 1,000 isn't going to all of a sudden create prostate cancer cells. I think at this point, we all believe there's what's called a saturation model that, above, that up to a certain point, testosterone will drive prostate cancer cells. But above that point, uh, which is probably somewhere around 180 to 200, above that point, giving additional testosterone will not drive testosterone replacement. So although uh, testosterone is contraindicated in men with 
active prostate cancer. Men who have been treated with uh, for prostate cancer who've had, either had their prostate removed uh, or have had other types of treatment for prostate cancer, they can be eligible for, for testosterone replacement therapy. And, you know, off-label, I think in the right hands with, again, with coordinated care, we have a lot of men now on what's called active surveillance for prostate cancer. Well, they have active prostate cancer in their body, but it's not aggressive enough to warrant treatment. And I think in those guys, with proper counseling, with proper follow-up, with po- proper coordination with their, with their oncologist or uro-oncologist, I think even those men can be treated safely for testosterone replacement. No, I mean, having that coordinated care and collaboration with uh, other disciplines sounds like it's critical in treating men with low T, especially if you're thinking of replacement therapy with their radiation oncologists or PCP, just like you said. I wanted to touch on one more topic. Um, which is infertility. You know, infertility is classically looked at a women's issue. And, and it's true that the women bear the greater burden of infertility. But about 50% of the problem sometimes can be the male's responsibility. You know, we always we remember the Seinfeld episode where Elaine tells Kramer not to wear boxers. They should wear briefs because that increases sperm count. So talk to us a little bit about male infertility. Where does testosterone play into that? And what are some behavioral modifications that men can use to prevent infertility or, or optimize their chances. So male infertility is a, a, another whole discussion that we can, we can spend probably two days talking about, if not more. But it's a great topic to bring up in this discussion of, of testosterone and, and men's health. And it is a, a big misconception that infertility is, is just a female problem. It, it's a couple's problem. 50% of of infertility has a male factor contributing to the uh, to the cause, and in about twenty to thirty percent of of the couples, actually the male factor is the only cause causing the infertility. And there are a whole host of different causes of male infertility. So you can go from things like genetic abnormalities to hormonal abnormalities, like we talked about, to anatomic abnormalities, like something called uh, varicoceles, which is the most common cause of what we call secondary infertility, uh, meaning men didn't have trouble getting pregnant when they were younger as they were get, getting older. This varicocele, which is a dilated vein in the scrotum, causing increased temperature in, in the testicle and scrotum, can cause have a progressive decline on their testicular function and in the, in their, in their fertility. So that's another common cause. Um, and then you can have um, men, about 1% of men can have no sperm production or what's called azospermia, so no sperm in their ejaculate. And there's a subset of men that can have a, a obstructive cause or blockage of, of their sperm. Um, and these all are, are important factors that can not only be diagnosed by a, a male reproductive specialist, but also treated by the male reproductive specialist. So boxes or briefs, or it doesn't matter? I think it's whatever you're comfortable in. <laughs> Lastly, you know, you're the director of male sexual health here at Walt Cornell, New York Presbyterian. Talk to us a little bit about that program. Who are the key members? Uh, what kind of patients do you see? And what does that kind of patient care experience look like? So it's definitely an integrative experience. It's an integrative experience within the Department of Urology. And then from the uh, infertility perspective, we have a very close relationship with CRM, which is Center for Reproductive Medicine. Uh, that's basically across the street from our offices, where we have monthly meetings, continuous discussions uh, of our patients, sharing you know uh, clinical trials as well. And within our department, there's three of us that specialize in male infertility. Uh, there's myself, Dr. Mark Goldstein, who's the director of male infertility, and then there's Dr. Peter Schlegel, who's the uh, outgoing chair of, of the department. And even among us in, in our institute, we have coordination of care where we share patients as well, share experiences. We collaborate on research, which I think is very important in moving our field forward. Absolutely. We, we, you know, we appreciate that. I appreciate the discussion with you. I think you know, low T is not something that comes up a lot in spine health, but sometimes patients bring it up. They just kind of report the symptoms that you discussed, low energy, low stamina, uh, sometimes low sex drive, but I typically refer them to you or your colleagues. So I appreciate your collaboration on those patients. So thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your expertise on low testosterone and TRT with potential patients. And thank you out there to the listeners for tuning into the Backstory podcast. Uh, when it comes to your health, when it comes to your wellness, and in this case, uh, libido and low testosterone, uh, remember that we've got your back. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Kishanian. Thank you again, Dr. Singh. It's been an honor. Thanks for listening to The Backstory. Please subscribe, rate the podcast, and review The Backstory on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play Music. 
And feel free to share this podcast on social media or even your own website or blog. This podcast is for general information purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. To learn more about Dr. Singh and his clinical research, please follow him on social media. You can also sign up for his newsletter by going to www.rickysinghmd.com. That's R-I-C-K-Y-S-I-N-G-H-M-D.com.